are still one week away from Pentecost. Pentecost is the birth of the church. On that day, the church was born. And we've been looking at how Israel had their chance to come into the knowledge of God and that they could have been God's physical chosen people. But they said, no, no, we don't want this close relationship with God. We'll just talk to Moses and you tell him what you want and he'll tell us. And the church, for the most part, has come into that same understanding in the 21st century. We don't really want God messing with our life. So we'll just get fire insurance. We don't want to go to hell, so we're just going to get fire insurance. And that will suffice. And so the church has settled for a whole lot less. And we've been talking about that and how in preparation for Pentecost, God wants the church to be like Jesus was. That's what he gave us the Holy Spirit for. Not just eternal life, but that we might have the power of God to help people get healed, get saved, to know God. But today I'm going to back up a little bit and I'm going to take you through from the cross to the preparation for Pentecost. What God did in that interim period from the time Jesus died till the time that he ascended and what he told the disciples to do. So I'm going to back up to after Jesus died on the cross. It says in John chapter 19, verse 38, it says, After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, and Joseph was one of the Pharisees that early on rejected Christ, but Joseph came to accept Jesus Christ as the Messiah. And it says here, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly. So we know that there are secret Christians, people who don't really want everybody to know that, but yet they have accepted Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews. I mean, if they crucified Jesus, the same fear was upon Joseph as was on the disciples, why they all went into hiding. He asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body. And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, remember Jesus said, you must be born again. He told that to Nicodemus back in early parts of John. Also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloe, you know, we thought that us 21st century people were the discoverers of aloe vera. Well, it says here that they had a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 100 pounds. Can you imagine 100 pounds of aloe vera and myrrh? I mean, that was a lot of bucks back then. And then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen. They wrapped his body around and around and around with strips of linen with the spices as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Now, in the place where he was first crucified, there was a garden. Remember me telling you that from the cross, you could look across the Kidron Valley and see the Eastern Gate and the temple area. That means that the place of the cross was over in the garden area. So there was a garden where the cross was, where they took Jesus down from the cross. And in the garden, there was a new tomb in which no one had yet been. Joseph had prepared himself a tomb, and he gave that tomb to Jesus. 
So there they laid Jesus because of the Jews' preparation day. Remember that this was the beginning of the Sabbath and you could not be in the presence of a dead person after sunset and still go through the holy time of the Sabbath, which was also in preparation for the Passover. So there were lots of rules that kept them from crucifying Jesus on the Sabbath. And so they had to have everything done before sunset. And it said, for the tomb was nearby. So they took him down and at three in the afternoon, he was going through the cross and suffering. And so in chapter 20, it says, now on the first day of the week, that was the day after Sabbath. And it's beautiful how the church celebrates Easter Sunday. And now here it says, now on the first day of the week, which was Sunday after the Sabbath. So Saturday, there's nothing spoken of about Saturday. But the following Sunday morning, it says, now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene. Remember that Mary was a demon-possessed woman who was delivered. She was of ill repute. And so Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple. Now the other disciple was John, and he was also the disciple that Jesus loved. And he refers to himself in there several times as the disciple that Jesus loved whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. And Peter, therefore, went out and the other disciple, and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down and looking in, he saw the linen clothes lying there. Now, if they were going to steal the body, would they take time to unwrap the body? No, they would have just taken the body with the wrapping and stolen him away, but it, they didn't do that. It says that the linen clothes were lying there, yet he did not go in, the disciple that Jesus loved. Then Simon Peter came following him, and he went into the tomb, and he saw the linen clothes lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but folded together in a place by itself. These are things that the observers came in and they saw that his body went through the linen and it was left right there in a pile just as if his body had gone through it. And then he folded the napkin. In other words, he's going to be back. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture. Remember that just like Jesus hadn't told them what was going to happen, they're kind of like, oh no, what are we going to do? He's dead. Our leader's dead. And they had not recalled what Jesus had said. It's important for you that I go away. If I do not go away, he cannot come. So that's why he's preparing them. Then the disciples went away again to their own home. But Mary, Mary Magdalene, Mary loved Jesus more than you and I can even imagine. He delivered her from demonic possession, from a life of degradation and embarrassment and sorrow. And Mary loved Jesus as much as any human can love another human. But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping. This person who had given her dignity, who had given her friendship and love when everybody else just used her. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. 
And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Now that tells us we're going to get a resurrected body, perfected. Perfected to the point that she didn't, re I mean, if anybody would know who Jesus was, Mary would. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And she, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, that I may take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And when he said Mary, she had heard that so many times. And she turned and said to him, Rabboni, teacher. And Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father and to my God and to your God. Now, isn't that beautiful? That is how you and I look to God, just like Jesus did. You go tell all the disciples that I'm ascending to the Father, and it's my Father and your Father. He's my God, and he's your God. And Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. And then in verse 19, it says, Then the same day at evening, so this was Sunday morning, the first Easter Sunday. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut. Now get this picture. The doors were shut. They were afraid that the Pharisees and the scribes were going to come and take them away. And they said that when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. First thing Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. Not peace that the world gives, but my peace, my peace that guards your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And so Jesus said to them again, peace to you. As the Father sent me, I also send you. Now I'm going to say this. As the Father sent the disciples, so he also sends you. You are being prepared to go out and do the things that Jesus did. Are you going to go in your own strength and in your own knowledge and understanding? No. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. He breathed on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, I've got a question for you. If that happened on the first day of the week, what did they receive right there? What did that Holy Spirit coming upon them indicate? You have any idea? Think about that. If this is the coming of the Holy Spirit, what happened at Pentecost? It was a second experience. See, when you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you receive salvation. You receive eternal life. They received eternal life right there. Jesus said to Mary, don't touch me. I haven't gone to the Father. And I've said this every week now during Pentecost that angels gathered every drop of blood that Jesus shed. And I know that they had vials of his blood and they brought that blood to him. Whatever you collect blood in as an angel 
And they gave it to Jesus after he rose from the dead. And he hadn't even ascended yet to the Father. And what he was going to do, I told you that right there, you don't see it? It's right there. And again, I do it on purpose because I want you to get, that's real. And Jesus said that there's a temple right there. And Moses built a replica of what he saw in heaven. And Jesus took his shed blood, and this is why he said, Mary, I haven't ascended yet. And so Mary saw him there before. I mean, he was fresh out of the wrapping, and she was kind of stunned that Jesus was standing here, and he said, I've got to go, Mary. I'm going to go and take my blood right now and sprinkle it on the Holy of Holies in heaven. And when I do that, all of the sins, see what Jesus told the disciples, receive the Holy Spirit. And they received eternal life because he had gone and sprinkled his blood on the temple in heaven. And he came and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. And then he said to them, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. And it was kind of like, why would that appear there? It seemed like it was out of place. But Jesus was saying, for the first time, you have authority. You know, the priests in the Catholic Church have the power of absolution. They have the power to forgive sin or to retain sin because of that statement right there. But Jesus gave that to the disciples to the believers. That's what you and I have. We have the power of absolution, the forgiveness of sin. And we can share with anyone who has, I've sinned too much. I've worn out my welcome with God. And said, no, all you have to do is ask for forgiveness of sin. And all of your sins are forgiven. Everything you've done has been forgiven. Now, Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. And the other disciples, therefore, said to him, We have seen the Lord. And so he said to them in private, Unless I see his hands, the print of the nails, and put my fingers into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, that's next Sunday, a week away, he only appeared to them on the Lord's Day. That's why Sunday is called the Lord's Day. He only appeared to them on the Lord's Day. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. And Jesus came, the door being shut, and he stood in their midst, and he said again, peace to you. And then he said to Thomas, can you just imagine, it's kind of like Peter saying, Lord, I'll die. I'm not going to deny you. But he did. And Thomas, oh, he, he was bold and said, until I stick my fingers in the nail-scarred hands, I'm not going to believe. And Jesus said to Thomas, reach your finger here. And look at my hand, and reach your hand here, and put it inside mine. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. Jesus says that to us. The most important thing you can do is believe. Don't be unbelieving. What is there that makes us doubt? What is there that makes us afraid to believe? And it's the devil. He wants us not to believe. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. And he goes on to say, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's us. Every one of us have believed, but yet we haven't seen. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name.
If you can believe this, you have eternal life. That's what eternal life is. Faith that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, that he died, that he rose again. And if you can believe that, you have eternal life. But this is the key. You cannot believe this unless you have the Holy Spirit. So if you believe that, you are saved. You have the Holy Spirit. Now, what I want to do is to flip over to Acts. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible or unmistakable, unmistakable proofs being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Jesus presented, he said, the kingdom of God has come unto you. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you have heard from me. Those words are in red. That means Jesus spoke these words to them. For truly, John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now, this is where Pentecostals lay claim to the second touch. So we know that Jesus breathed on them and they received the Holy Spirit. That was salvation. That was eternal life. And he says, now you must wait until you have been baptized with the Holy Spirit. Not many days from now. In 10 days, it's Pentecost. For us, it's a week, a week away. I want you to realize that Jesus is preparing you for the day of Pentecost. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Wouldn't it be sensible for them to ask that? Okay, Jesus, here you are. Now you've rose from the dead. You've ascended to the Father. You've got the Holy Spirit. You've given us salvation. Are you coming back now to establish your kingdom forever? And what did he tell them? It's not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, when he had spoken these words, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. This, to me, was just is beautiful. When God himself departed from the temple, when Israel went into captivity, the prophet sat over there where Jesus would ascend to, and he looked and he saw the cloud come up, and it ascended over the Kidron Valley, and it came up, and the cloud ascended to heaven. That's what happened when God left the temple when Israel went into captivity. And now Jesus walked over to the garden area where he was crucified, but he also, it was at that point in the garden area that he rose and ascended into the cloud. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go up into heaven. When Christ returns, He's going to return just the same way. That is what happened at the ascension of Jesus Christ. And from the time of his death to the time of his ascension, the preparation 
of the disciples was this, that you be ready when the Holy Spirit comes. You are going to go out and do the things that Jesus did. You're going to pray for the sick, and they're going to recover. You are going to prophesy. You are going to do the things that Jesus did. He expected us to carry on his ministry. And that's what we do until he returns. We go out, bring in the lost, heal the sick, cast out demons, just speak the word. It's done. If a person is demon-possessed, you just say, be gone in the name of Jesus, and it'll be done. And you don't have to do anything. God will do it. So this is what God is preparing us for next week. I've been teaching and preaching about Pentecost for 40 days, and now it's going to happen. Next week, I'm not going to be surprised if you don't all receive the manifestations that God has in person. I'm expecting it. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you that Jesus told us in advance. It's important for you that I go away. And Lord, for 2,000 years, you've been away. And Lord, you have given your Holy Spirit to us who believe. And Lord, now you expect us to go out and bring in those who do not believe, that they may believe, that they may be healed. And you've given unto us authority, you've given unto us power. Let it be in Jesus' name.